Getting into ham radio can be an intimidating and confusing endeavor. Based off a lot of questions that I get from new hams, I decided to put together this video where we go over what I would consider the top five tips that uh, I would give to new hams or people thinking about getting into ham or amateur radio. If you have tips or tricks of your own, go ahead and post them below. I'd love to hear all about it in the comments section. Well, let's go ahead and get started. All right, folks, tip number one, safety first. I'm not trying to be a safety Sally here. But what I want to express to everybody is, is that as we get into amateur radio or ham radio, we are going to expose ourselves to some potential hazards. We want to make sure that we're mindful of these hazards and we take the appropriate precautions. The first thing I have here is don't get shocked. We're going to be playing around with electricity, volts and current, and we want to make sure that we're not creating an environment or situation that could be potentially hazardous, hurt ourselves or one of our loved ones. You want to make sure all your connections are solid and you're using good quality cables. Also, you can get shocked by touching an antenna, so you want to make sure that your antennas are mounted in a way that people won't touch them or come into contact by accident. The next thing I have is don't burn your house down. And that kind of goes along with the first one. You want to make sure that all your electrical connections are terminated properly. They're not covered up by clutter or junk, and everything's done according to best practices. The last thing you want to have happen is burn your house down because you're playing radio. The next thing I have is don't fall off the, the roof or out, off a ladder or out of a tree. A lot of times when ham radio operators are placing antennas, some folks climb up on a roof. You're not going to see me do that. I don't trust myself on a roof. Um, I know a guy who fell off a ladder and hurt his leg pretty good. Um, and oftentimes in the news, you'll hear of hams falling off of towers because they're not using a safety harness or the appropriate safety equipment. Just be careful when you do these things. Serious injury or death could even occur. Oh, that's a real downer. The next thing I have is don't drive distracted. A lot of times hams, myself included, will install amateur radio equipment in our vehicles. When you're driving, make sure you're paying attention to driving. It's always fun to get a quick uh, conversation in, a quick QSO, but you want to make sure that you're driving first, playing radio second. I know that that's something that seems fairly obvious, but sometimes it's easy to get caught up and you got wires and you got a hand mic and things like that. And maybe you're trying to tune something in. Just make sure that you're being safe. Um, the next thing I have on here is RF exposure. So we are going to be emitting RF into the air, and that can be potentially dangerous at certain levels. Make sure that you understand exposure levels. Make sure that you're not operating too close to an antenna, and make sure that you understand how close you are in relationship to that antenna, and make sure you understand how much RF is really being dissipated into your environment. The next thing I have is just pay attention to what you're doing. We're all smart people. We're all capable of making good and bad decisions, unfortunately. We want to make sure that we're paying attention and we're doing things the right way. Tip number two is start slow. Don't buy everything at once. I've talked to new hams and they have this giant list of all this equipment and gear that they want to buy. And what I tell them is your preferences are going to change with your experience. Start slow. Start getting equipment slow. Build some experience and it may change what you think you want to do. A lot of times what we envision ourselves doing in amateur radio three years from now is not what we're actually going to be uh, doing. Your first ham shack is not going to be your last ham shack. Ham shacks are under a constant state of evolution. New products, tools are, re, uh, re, are released onto the market and that may change, change your mind about something that you think you want, uh, something you think you want to buy. Hams will often trade or swap gear and that may change too. Um, again, it's constant evolution, and building out your ham shack is a marathon and not a sprint. Amateur radio is often referred to as the best thousand hobbies within a hobby. Your interests may change. You may today say that I have no interest in doing digital modes, um, and that might change six months from now, 12 months, 12 months from now. All of a sudden, digital modes are something that you're very interested in, and it may require you to look at some equipment that you purchase differently. I have Rome wasn't built, and your shack won't be built in a day. Just take some time, step back, and relax. When we get into amateur radio, it's a long-term hobby. Um, some people will call it a service. But generally, you'll talk to folks who are active in ham radio, and they've been doing it 10, 15, 20, 30 years. And they didn't get everything all at once. It takes time to build experience, to build skill sets, and to build your equipment. I have try before you buy. If you get the opportunity, you definitely want to use a piece of equipment before you pay for it. Sometimes you can join a club or meet up with friends and you can switch or swap equipment. Maybe somebody will loan you something you can play around and say, you know what, I really don't like this radio. I really don't like operating in this way. Um, it's really, really helpful if you can try something before you buy it. And have leave, leave room for some growth. That's going to be space in your ham shack. It's going to be <laughs> some space in your wallet or your bank account. Um, 
buying everything at once can be fun and exciting, but a lot of times you'll spend or invest money in equipment or gear that you don't use. A lot of times when you go into somebody's ham shack or you look at online ham shack tours, you see tons of equipment sitting there that's not being used. Maybe investing that differently would be a better idea for you. The next tip, tip number three, is find an Elmer. Now the concept of an Elmer used to be that there would be an older gentleman that was very experienced in ham radio and could guide you, encourage you, and teach you along the way as we grow and build our skill set. Today's ham radio environments have so many different moving parts. There's so much technology. There's so many different things that you can do. It's very difficult to find one person who can guide you on all of those things, teach you all of those things. So oftentimes people turn to communities now, whether it's communities on YouTubes or Facebook groups or online chat rooms. Um, maybe it's clubs. But it's a good idea to surround yourself with some, some experienced amateur radio operators that can help you expose you to certain things and maybe help nurture some of your interests. What I have here is maybe it's somebody to bounce ideas off of. It's always a good idea to have somebody who can act as a soundboard for something that you want to try, maybe something you want to buy. You can share experiences and ideas, and that will give you new ideas and maybe give you some thoughts around something that you might want to get into. Maybe you want to get into contesting, and you can talk to somebody who's an avid contester, and that would help you out. It would help you plan. It would help you prepare for that. Um, offer advice and guidance. Somebody who can offer you advice and guidance is really important. Um, provide help, tips, and tricks. A lot of times I'll be working on something and I want to maybe mount an antenna a certain way and I'm having some struggles with it. And I'll talk to people who I consider, you know, peers or Elmers and they'll say, oh, no, 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 I had a, had a similar situation and here's how I did that. So it's really a helpful thing and it really helps keep you encouraged in the hobby. Um, last thing is I have a share equipment. Some of my friends and I will swap equipment around and say, oh, I've got this piece of gear. I'm not really using it. You want to try it out? Um, and when you, when you do that, it gives you more experience than you would get if you were going it alone. I think finding an Elmer is a really important thing. So tip number four is getting on the air. Don't be intimidated. Listen, learn, and then speak. When I talk about being intimidated, there are some grumps out there, unfortunately, and they will give you a hard time. And when that happens, just ignore them. A good way to get on the air is local nets for UHF and VHF for 2 meters and 70 centimeters. You can buy a handheld ham radio for 25 50 100 bucks, and you can program it, and then you can talk onto these nets. It's probably a good idea to listen to them a few times, understand the cadence and the protocol that they use for joining the net, giving any news or updates that you might have, and then checking out of the net. It's um, a really easy way to get on the air and help you practice the mechanics of operating. The other thing I have on here is HF nets. Two to come to mind right now are 72 Chew, and I'll post a link to that below, in the um, OMIS net. And these are nets that encourage people to join practice making contacts, giving signal reports, and talking to other operators. They're generally very welcoming to hams, new hams, and experienced hams alike. Again, it's a good way to get onto the air when you know a frequency and a time frame when people are going to be operating. Another thing I have on here is soda and poda, which is summits on the air and parks on the air. Those are activities where amateur radio operators pack up some gear and go to a park or climb a mountain and set up a station. When they do this, they want to make contacts so they can score points. It's not really a contest per se, but they use points for tracking. When people do this, they are actively seeking contacts, and it's a great way for you to make contact with somebody who's going to be excited to hear from you and non-judgmental. They're going to be very thankful that you're making that contact. They're going to be polite, but they're not going to want to rag you or talk a long time. They're going to want to make that contact and move on to the next one. Again, it's a great way to get some experience operating. The next thing I have on here is contests. I'm not a contester. It's not for me. I don't have any problem with people doing it, and I say more power to them. It's just not something that I'm interested in. But contests are another way that you can make some contacts. You can get used to the mechanics, and you can talk to people. It can be exciting if that's what you're into. I have skeds on here, and a lot of times what you can do is you can just schedule a contact with some of your buddies. Just say, hey, be on this frequency at this time, and we'll, we'll test it out and see if propagation's in our favor or not. And we'll make a quick contact. The last thing I have on here is calling CQ or responding to somebody calling CQ. A lot of times when you call CQ, somebody will respond. Sometimes people will respond and tell you, hey, this frequency was already in use, bro. What are you doing? So you want to make sure that you're following rules and practices, checking to see if the station or the frequency is clear. And if it is, then calling CQ. And then you also want to make sure that you're using language or vernacular that's appropriate for ham radio use. 
a lot of times somebody will come along and say, well, we don't say that or we don't talk that way in ham radio. Just thank them, ignore them, and don't take it personally. Now, tip five. This is probably the worst. It's just follow the rules. In terms of the FCC, there are certain laws, rules, and regulations that we need to abide to as amateur radio or ham radio operators. It's really not that difficult. We learn about these rules as we get our license and progress our licenses. Also, you want to pay attention to band plans. Band plans are in alignment with the rules, but they also kind of are best practices developed over years for how and where we operate. Now, where you can operate on a 20-meter band, for example, is part of the FCC laws, but what you do in different segments of the 20-meter band are part of the band plan or the generally accepted practices, which is right below band plans on my list here. So, for example, there's a portion of the band where folks like to operate continuous wave or CW, sometimes referred to as Morse code. Now, I'm within my rights to go on there and start doing voice and calling CQ, but I don't want to do that because I'm going to upset people. And that area of the band is typically used for CW, so I'll just find a different frequency. The other thing I have here is, is that there's state or local coordination, and this is more on UHF and VHF frequencies, and it's really for repeater coordination. You want to stay off channels or frequencies that are specified for repeater usage, and you want to make sure that you use them accordingly, according to your state or local governing bodies. I have ham lingo. This isn't really a rule, but it's more of a practice or a guideline. Some hams will get upset with you if you don't use ham lingo or use ham lingo inappropriately. One thing would be phonetics. So say an alpha Charlie Bravo instead of ABC. You want to do that. Some people use pro signs or referred to as Q codes. You can do that too. It would just uh, be a lot easier on you to learn some of this lingo, lingo and then uh, bring, it, bring it into your vocabulary when you're operating. I also have be polite and courteous. If there's a dispute over frequency, say, okay, I'll move. You know, a lot of times hams get really possessive. They'll say, hey, this is my frequency. I've been using this frequency for 20 years. I don't know if that's true or not. But what you want to do is you just want to make sure that you're nice. Don't be a grump and don't let somebody else being a grump turn you into a grump. And the other thing I have on here is try to stay away from politics and religion or any conversation. It could be polarizing. Sometimes that gets people really upset and they'll want to argue. Um, they'll say mean and hateful things. So it's best just to stay away from it. So like I often do in these videos, I have a bonus tip. And this one's just have fun. Ham radio can be challenging. Be patient. You're going to have a lot of fun. You're going to have some successes, but there are going to be challenges and setbacks that you're going to need to overcome. So just be patient. Take, take, take some time. and uh, you, can't, you can't rush goodness is what I always say. Um, here I have some hams or grumps. Ignore them. I think I covered that a little bit earlier. Keep working at it. Um, skill and experience will grow. You're not going to know everything. You're not going to be able to do everything when you first start out. You're not going to be able to do it after you start out and you've been at it for a while. If you're not having fun, take a break. There's been a lot of times where I've gotten really frustrated with either equipment or with an antenna or band conditions or, or whatever. Sometimes you just turn the radio off, walk away, and go do something else for a little while. It'll be here when you come back. And the last thing I have here is hang out with hams who have fun. Generally speaking, if you want to have fun, hang around fun people. That's what I always do. And that's really it, folks. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments, suggestions or recommendations, go ahead and post them below and I'll do my best to respond. Thanks again.